Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm continuing my research into the programmable input-output features of the RP2040. Viewer Ishak Adir requested that I demonstrate how to make a function generator using direct memory access. I think that's a great project, so why don't you join me as I build an arbitrary waveform generator using the Raspberry Pi Pico. Back in the day, signal generators were analog oscillators that generated a variable frequency and amplitude sine wave. They were used to adjust and align radio receivers of the era. Later, function generators added other waveforms, including triangle, sawtooth, and square waves. These additional waveforms were shaped by modifying the base signal with resistors, capacitors, diodes, and inductors. As microprocessors became more prevalent, Analog function generators started to be replaced by arbitrary waveform generators where almost any waveform that can be imagined can be output as an electrical signal. These are becoming very common. For instance, my new oscilloscope has one built in. With its high speed, accessible GPIO, direct memory access, and low cost, the Raspberry Pi Pico is particularly well suited to be the basis for a very inexpensive a capable arbitrary waveform generator. Let's look at a flow diagram. First we'll generate a wavetable and start as an array in memory. When we're ready to output the wave, we'll use direct memory access to repeatedly move the data from memory to the programmable input output. The PIO will provide the timing to send the parallel data to the GPIO pins. The GPIO pins will output digital parallel electrical signals to the digital to analog converter. The digital to analog converter combines the parallel signals into one analog signal, which is then amplified by the amplifier for use. The first four blocks are provided by the Pico. We'll have to add the DAAC and the amplifier. A digital to analog converter also known as a DAC, is a circuit that converts digital signals into analog signals. Both main types of DACs are resistor networks which generate smaller voltages for the lesser significant bits and larger voltages for the more significant bits. The only difference is how the resistors are connected. The weighted resistor network uses a string of binary weighted resistors whose value increases with the binary progression from the most to the least significant bit. That is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. I used a variation of the weighted resistor method for the VGA interface that I presented in episode 6. The disadvantage of this method is that we would need eight different values of high precision resistors to provide an accurate 8-bit conversion. The R2R ladder network is basically strings of parallel and series connected resistors acting as interconnected voltage dividers whose output voltage depends solely on the interaction of the input voltages with each other. This network only needs two different precision resistor values and only one value if you use parallel resistors. Although R2R networks use more resistors than weighted resistor networks, the resistors are much easier to obtain. I got a 1% resistor assortment, which included 21K and 22K resistors for around $6. Let's put together the circuit. First, I measured each one of the resistors and recorded their values. I determined that the mode of the 2K resistors was almost exactly double the mode of the 1K resistors. Then I chose resistors with resistances closest to the mode for each value. This allowed me to get resistor values within a half percent of the desired value. This should be good enough for this exercise. Since I'm going to be working with higher frequencies, I trimmed the resistor leads and chose to use GPIO 8 through 15 to keep the runs as short as possible. I wired the circuit on a breadboard, leaving room for the amplifier. For the amplifier, I chose an LM358 which is a common medium speed operational amplifier that's capable of single supply operation. Mainly, I used it because I had several in my stash. It's not that fast, so I don't expect great high speed performance. 
I configured the op amp for Unity Gain. That way, I can get by using the plus 5 volt VBUS power from the USB port. Next, I'll do a quick proof of concept MicroPython program to see if the DAC works. This script just sends increasing binary data to the PIO, which then outputs 8 parallel bits through the GPIO. Good, we have a signal, although it's really slow. The goal is to use DMA to transmit the data to PIO. If you remember from my DMA video, we can use one DMA channel to start another one after it is finished. Since I want the waveform to be uninterrupted, I want each of the two DMA data channels to immediately start the other one without relying on two DMA control channels. This is possible if we align the data table to a naturally occurring memory boundary. This is easy to perform in C, C++, but there's no good way to do it in MicroPython. I know because I've tried a lot. Therefore, I decided I would use C, C++ to control my arbitrary waveform generator. Let's go through the programs in detail. I'll put a link to all the programs in the description below. The main C program does the heavy lifting in this case. We'll start out by including all the libraries we need, including the usual cast of characters, as well as DMA and our PIO program. Here we define our constants, including pi, and the clock frequency we'll use for pacing the PIO data. Since there will be 256 elements in the waveform array, and we'll output one element per clock cycle, the PIO clock frequency of 10,000 should give us a waveform frequency of roughly 39 Hz. Inside the main program, I'll initialize the standard I.O. so that I can print from within the program. I'll set the number of GPIO pins to output to the DAC to 8, and the number of elements in the waveform buffer to 256. I'll also initialize the variable factor as floating point. I'll need that later. This section configures the PIO and starts it running by using a PIO helper function. See episode 7 of the PIO Chronicles for more information. I'll put a link in the upper right hand corner. Here we set the PIO block, the state machine number, the PIO program offset, the start of the GPIO block, the number of pins in our GPIO block, and the state machine clock frequency. Now I'll reserve two DMA channels, Wave DMA channel A and Wave DMA channel B. Here I initialize the waveform buffer as an integer array with 256 elements. What's important is that I will align the start of the array to be on a naturally occurring 256 byte address boundary. This will allow the DMA to keep cycling through the same addresses without having to rewrite the starting address to the DMA control register each time. In this section, I'll fill the waveform buffer. An integer divided by an integer will yield an integer. However, since I need a floating point value to calculate the wavetable, I'll cast i as a floating point variable for this equation. This equation is the basis for the arbitrary waveform. This equation could be any continuous function. Here I'm using a simple sine wave. Now it's time to create the configurations for the two DMA channels to operate in a ping pong manner. Both configuration blocks are similar, except wave DMA channel A chains to wave DMA channel B and Wave DMA channel B chains to Wave DMA channel A. Let's quickly go through the configuration. We'll start with the default DMA configuration, which will transfer 32 bits at a time while incrementing the read address and not incrementing the write address. Next, we'll immediately start the other DMA channel when this one has finished its transfer. Here, the PIO will provide the pacing for the DMA, that is, the PIO will control the speed of the DMA transfer. Finally, we'll set the DMA to loop the read address every 2 to the 8th 
or 256 times. This simplifies managing the read address, allowing us to eliminate a control DMA channel that rewrites the read address prior to the start of each data transfer. This provides for a seamless data stream. I'll complete the configuration of each DMA channel by assigning the configuration block and assigning the write address as the PIO state machine zero transmit FIFO register. I'll tell DMA to read the data from the wavetable buffer and make 256 transfers, but don't start yet. Now that the configurations are assigned, I'll start the first DMA channel. The DMA channels will now transfer data to the PIO without input from the main core. This section of code provides the ability to print values for debugging. I also expect that I'll be able to use this area in the future to reconfigure the AWG on the fly. The PIO program is a very straightforward program. Just output 8 bits every clock cycle. Let's go through the PIO program. First, we'll identify the program name, in this case, PIO Byte Out. Next is the actual PIO program. We just output 8 bits and loop back and do it again. Now we'll configure the PIO. Include the clock header file, then set up the PIO configuration helper function. Here we connect the PIO instance to the 8 GPIOs. We don't need to do this for the state machine to read values from the GPIO, but it is required to set an output value. Here we set the PIO 8-pin group direction as out. Here we'll start the PIO default configuration and map the 8 GPIO outputs to the PIO. This statement sets the state machine clock rate. We'll use AutoPool to save a clock cycle during each iteration by not having to add a discrete pull before the out instruction. Now we'll load our configuration and start the state machine running. Let's try it out. I'll set the PIO clock to 10,000 Hz. This should give us a waveform frequency of about 39 Hz. I'll compile and link the program using cmakelist.txt. Then after plugging in the USB cable while holding down the boot select button, I'll load the UF2 file into the Pico. The trace looks really good. Next, I'll try a few other clock rates, all the way up to 100 megahertz. We're getting a wave frequency of 390 kilohertz at a very low amplitude. This is expected since we're really stretching the capabilities of the ALM358 at this frequency. How accurate is the Pico? Well, here's a comparison between the Pico generating a 60 Hz signal compared to the scope calibration trace tied to line voltage. As you can see, the traces are in almost perfect sync. Success! Thanks for joining me today. We made an arbitrary waveform generator with a Raspberry Pi Pico and a homemade digital-to-analog converter. The results were really good and the accuracy seems outstanding. Next steps are to improve the user interface, add other functions, and increase the wave frequency with a higher speed amplifier. Maybe I'll tackle those in a future video. Let me know if that's something that would interest you. If you like this video, or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!